Hi, this is George Graybill again, and I'd like to read uh, another chapter from my book, Stuff, or The Fortunes, Foibles, and Fiascos of Those Who Sought to Understand Matter. This is chapter eight, Kinetic Molecular Theory, or the Polish Science Oscars. There is no such thing as the Polish Science Oscars. If there were, there is no doubt that Marian Smolokowski would have received such an award in 1906. That was the year Marian, let's, let's just use his first name, published an article that explained something called Brownian motion. Here is a picture of uh, Marion and his amazing mustache. The award ceremony would have gone something like this. And now we come to the award for the best explanation of very tiny bits of stuff. The envelope, please. The master of ceremonies opens the envelope, removes the slip of paper and reads, Marion Smolakowski. Did I pronounce that right? Marion bounds onto the stage to a round of applause and shakes hands with the Master of Ceremonies. The MC hands Marion something that looks like a small statue of a chicken wearing a crown. Thank you so much! Wait, wait, we have to stop here and explain the events that led up to Marion's triumph and explain exactly what he did. We'll come back to his acceptance speech later. Here's a picture of Marion enjoying uh, mountain, he enjoyed mountain climbing and what we today would probably call extreme skiing. This all has to do with whether atoms are real or not. First, what is Brownian in motion? Picture those little specks that you see floating in a beam of light shining across a dark, dusty room. If you were to look very closely at those specks, you would see that they are jiggling around. The same jiggling can be seen for little bits of stuff suspended in a liquid. That jiggling is called Brownian motion. Way back in 50 BC, uh, BC a Roman philosopher named Lucretius thought about this motion. He said the specks zigzagged around because they were being struck by atoms. If you make it atoms and molecules, he was right. He didn't do any experiments or calculations, so he was really just guessing. Good guess, though. No one paid much attention to his idea because this was during that long, long period of time when atoms were out of style. We should explain here why this chapter is out of place in the timeline. Around 1800, scientists knew how gases behave. They knew how pressure, temperature, and volume of gases were related. They had also heard of Dalton's atomic theory. All scientists had to do was connect the two ideas. They didn't need any more experiments. They just had to do the mass, math. Doing the math took about a hundred years, at which point Marion S. added the final touch. When they were finished, they created the kinetic theory of gases. Kinetic means motion. The theory shows that all the P, V, T relationships can be explained by the motion of gas particles. Pressure, temperature, and volume of gases are called bulk or macroscopic properties. They are easy to measure, which led to the early discovery of the gas laws. The laws can be combined into one law called the ideal gas law. The simplest form of this law is P times V divided by T equals a constant, um, where the constant is for a given amount of ideal gas. The ideal gas is one that follows this law exactly. None really do, but most come so close we can forgive them. You can do some easy mental math and see 
Now, how the law works. First, pretend that one of the variables, uh, pressure, volume, or temperature is constant. For example, if temperature is constant, then pressure times volume equals a constant. If P increases, then V must decrease. For PV to stay, for PV to stay constant, think about squeezing a balloon, and you will see that this is true. If you feel like it, you can see what happens when you hold pressure or volume constant, and then look for examples of this in everyday life. But how can it be shown that the motion of gas particles explains uh, PV over T equals C? Think about it. You have billions and billions of molecules zipping randomly around the container, bouncing off the walls and off each other, like a room full of three-year-olds on sugar. You have all the information you need. You know the mass of the molecules, the number of molecules, and the volume of the container. You also know Newton's laws of motion. You can simply you can simplify things by using Dalton's hard little ball model to represent the molecules. Now try to calculate, like, let's say, the pressure in the container from this information. Talk about a can of worms. Daniel Bernoulli got the math started in 1738. He wrote a book that included some ideas about gases. <clears throat> he said that gases are made of invisible particles moving in all directions and that their energy of motion, called kinetic energy, is the true source of heat. He was able to show that gas pressure is directly related to the kinetic energy of the gas particles. These ideas weren't a big hit because people weren't ready to believe in atoms. In the early 1800s, several scientists, including John Harapath and John James Waterston, made a good progress on the, on the math needed to connect particle properties to, to bulk properties. Bernoulli was, uh, Bernoulli, Bernoulli was only ignored. These guys were laughed at. Herapath didn't know about Bernoulli's work, but he was able to show uh, the same relationship between particle energy and pressure. He also tried to show that temperature is a measure of the speed of particle motion. He got off to a good start, then screwed it up. In those days in England, when you thought you had made a big discovery, you wrote a paper about it and took it to the Royal Society of London. John tried this in 1820, and they rejected it, which caused some hard feelings. Harapath had the last laugh because he lived long enough to get credit for the parts of his theory that he got right. Here's a picture of the Royal Society. No girls allowed. John James Waterston's story is more depressing, but also more interesting. He was born in Scotland in 1811. After getting a good, a good education, he got a great job in India in 1839. India was part of the huge British Empire at the time, and a lot of people from Great Britain, which includes Scotland, were sent there to see that everyone behaved the way the British thought they should. The pay for the India job was great, but what John James liked best was that he had a lot of free time. He used the time to work on various science projects that fascinated him. He was best known for his work on the kinetic theory of gases. In 1843, Waterston wrote a book in which he mentioned some of his ideas about kinetic theory. The book was widely ignored. He continued to work on kinetic theory math until he arrived at some important results. He, his calculations showed that molecular motion explains the pressure times volume is a, equals C relationship called Boyle's Law, and that PV over T equals C. Uh, he also showed that temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of molecules. This led him to suggest a temperature scale on which zero degrees is the temperature at which molecules hypothetically stop moving. 
It is interesting that early versions of kinetic theory were criticized because they implied there was a lower limit to temperature. It seemed ridiculous to many scientists to suggest that there was some limit to how cold it could get. There is a limit, and it is minus 273 degrees Celsius. There is a scale based on this a temperature called the Kelvin scale. On the Kelvin scale, minus 273 degrees C equals 0 K. And water melts at 273 K and boils at 373 K. Not degrees K, just K or Kelvins. Note that the equation for the ideal gas theory, PV over T equals C, only works if temperature is expressed in Kelvins. Like Herapath, he sent his paper to the Royal Society. They rejected it and said, the paper is nothing but nonsense. They thought the idea that pressure was caused by molecules banging into the walls of a container made no sense. They also thought that the idea of a temperature of zero was just nuts. They told the young scientists they told him young scientists should start with easy projects and not try to make some big discovery on their first try. The Royal Society had this odd rule that they never sent rejected papers back to the authors. Watterson had never heard of the rule and he hadn't kept a copy for himself. The math was so complicated he didn't feel like rewriting the whole thing and besides he had moved on to other interests. One of those interests was solar radiation. India had a lot more solar radiation than England did, so it seemed like a good place to study it. Unfortunately, John got too much of it one day and had a sunstroke. As a result, he suffered from dizzy spells for the rest of his life. In 1857, Watterson went home and bounced around Great Britain for a few years before finally settling down in Edinburgh. Scotland. He continued his studies and experiments and published more papers which were mostly ignored or rejected. <clears throat> this may account for his withdrawing from scientific circles and leading a secluded life during the last years of his life. One day in 1883, he went, John went for a walk along the Edinburgh waterfront and disappeared without a trace. His body was never found. Everyone assumed he had had one of his dizzy spells and fell off the pier into the ocean. It's not clear how they could be so sure. What about alien abduction? In 1891, the Secretary, the Secretary of the Royal Society, Lord Raleigh, ran across Watterson's paper uh, in the pure nonsense file and read it. By that time, many of Johnson's conclusions had been verified and were widely accepted by the scientific community. Community, Lord Raleigh estimated that rejecting Watterson's and Herapath's papers had delayed the development of kinetic theory by 10 to 20 years. In 1857, the German physicist and mathematician Rudolf Clausius came up with a kinetic theory of gases, and this time people listened. It was similar to the work of Herapath and Watterson, with a few bells and whistles added. Rudy added spinning and vibrating to the motions of particles including, included in the calculations. He also <coughs> figured out the average distance of particle travel between collisions. Then along came James Clerk Maxwell and Lud Ludwig Boltzmann. They further refined kinetic theory uh, with the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. This showed uh, the fraction of all the particles that had speeds within any given range. Now kinetic theory could be used to explain and make predictions about a number of bulk physical properties including diffusion, spreading out of gases, heat conduction, and changes of state, that is, melting, boiling, so forth. All this theoretical success 
was made possible by people who believed in the existence of atoms. And yet, even by the year 1900, many scientists and philosophers did not believe in atoms. Most chemists believed that atoms, um, believed in atoms because atomic theory helped explain and predict chemical reactions. Physicists and philosophers, not so much. Ludwig Boltzmann lived most, outlived most of the other pioneers of kinetic theory. Toward the end of his life, he was pretty much left alone to defend kinetic theory and atomic theory against the doubters. Some of the objections were philosophical, so he studied philosophy for, for a while to help in winning the arguments. It didn't seem to help much. The sense um, that belief in atoms was losing ground made him depressed. Depression was kind of his thing. He swung back and forth between periods of high energy and creativity and withdrawal into deep gloom. Today we would say he, he was bipolar. Here is Ludwig Boltzmann on a good day. Then along came Al and Marion to the rescue. That is the famous Albert Einstein and the little known Marion Schmolkowski. In 1905 uh, to 1906, they, they did separate studies of Brownian motion and came up with the same results. News traveled slowly in those days, so neither knew uh, the other was working on the same thing. Their studies showed several things, including a way to calculate the actual size of atoms and molecules. Perhaps the most important result was that there was now and no way to deny, deny the existence of atoms. Well, back to the Oscars. Marion says, Thank you for this chicken. The master of ceremonies whispering, It's an eagle. Actually, it's your Oscar. Marion, Oh, well, thanks. <clears throat> master of ceremonies, You certainly deserve it, Marion. And here is what the Polish Os science Oscar looks like. Uh, it looks sort of like a chicken, but it's actually an eagle wearing a crown. Um, it is on the Polish coat of arms, so it is sort of Poland's logo. It comes from the le legend that Lech, the founder of Poland, saw a white eagle sitting in, it, sitting in a nest one day. He took this as a good omen and stopped right there and started Poland. And back to the uh, award ceremony, Marion says, I have so many people to thank. People that really laid the groundwork for the development of the kinetic theory. Dan Bernoulli, Johnny Harapath, Johnny Jim Waterston. Those guys got no respect. Who even remembers them now? Of course, there's Rudy Clausius, Jimmy Maxwell and Ludy Boltzmann. I couldn't have done it without them. Let's all hope that Boltzmann is feeling better. I understand he's feeling grumpy and down in the dumps again. So basically, I showed that those little bits of zigzagging around um, when Brownian motion is happening <clears throat> are acting that way because they are being hit by atoms or molecules. The math is a real bear, so let's not get into that. Are there any questions? A man from the audience asks, did Albert Einstein, didn't Albert Einstein do the same study at about the same time as you? Marion says, Albert who? From a six-year-old boy, why do you have a girl's name? Marion, a lot of men are named Marion. From a woman way in the back. Why is the sky blue? Marion. Now that is a very good question. I'll get back to you on that. Schmolakowski published his paper on Brownian motion in July 1906. It should have cheered up grumpy old Boltzmann, but apparently he never read it. He hanged himself in September of that year. In 1908, Marion published an article explaining why the sky is blue. And that is the end of chapter 8.
the next chapter, chapter 9, is the, called The Birth of the Periodic Table, or Dimitri's Dream. Now, if you scroll down, um, you can see uh, a link to a place where you can uh, uh, see the book, buy it, read the reviews, and so forth. Um, and if you want to subscribe to the uh, um, my YouTube channel, uh, you can click on the subscribe button below. Thank you. See you next time. Bye.